farmers use fertilizers to increase the nitrogen content of soil because more nitrogen improves crop yields. One of the fertilizers used is a chemical, ammonium nitrate. To make this requires ammonia gas and nitric acid. Ammonia gas is made industrially by mixing nitrogen and hydrogen gases in a container under pressure. This is the equation. One nitrogen molecule and three hydrogen molecules will react to form two molecules of ammonia. But reduce the pressure and the ammonia gas will revert back into nitrogen and hydrogen gas. The reaction is reversible depending on the pressure. In industry, the reaction takes place in a pressurized tower and as a catalyst, iron is used. It's called the Haber process after the German chemist who invented it. A temperature of 450 degrees Celsius and a pressure 200 times greater than atmospheric pressure are used to maximize the conversion to ammonia. The resulting ammonia gas is the first chemical needed to make ammonium nitrate. The other is nitric acid. To make nitric acid on an industrial scale, ammonia gas is oxidized in a huge burner. Ammonia reacts with oxygen in the air to produce nitrogen monoxide and water but it needs a platinum catalyst for the reaction to happen at a reasonable rate. When a platinum wire is heated and then suspended in the air above a solution of ammonia, it glows, indicating that vaporizing ammonia is reacting with oxygen in the air. It's the same glow we saw in the industrial burner, which is also from a platinum catalyst. But in industry, that catalyst is a very expensive sheet of platinum gauze. The next step is for the nitrogen monoxide to be oxidized further. Nitrogen monoxide reacts with more oxygen to produce nitrogen dioxide. To a flask of colorless nitrogen monoxide gas, add air and it forms brown nitrogen dioxide. The final step in producing nitric acid industrially involves reactions between nitrogen dioxide and water. This is the final equation for those reactions. In the lab, we can demonstrate the reaction. The flask contains some water. Then brown nitrogen dioxide gas is added and the flask is shaken to mix them. And the brown gas begins to disappear as it reacts with the water and produces a clear solution of nitric acid. Finally, ammonium nitrate will be made by adding nitric acid to ammonia solution. As the acid is added from the funnel on the left, a reaction occurs immediately, forming a cloud of white ammonium nitrate. Today, objects made of plastic are everywhere and indispensable. But these plastic products are made from a natural resource which was formed millions of years ago. They're made from this fossil fuel, crude oil. 
but before it can be used in the plastics industry, it has to be processed. And a key reaction that happens at the refinery is called cracking. Cracking is where the long chain molecules in the oil are broken down into shorter ones. To understand what's happening in these towers, we will crack a molecule of crude oil. In the lab, this is liquid paraffin. It's just one of the chemicals refined from oil. A paraffin molecule is a long chain of 20 or more carbon atoms joined together by single bonds with hydrogen atoms attached to each carbon atom. A carbon molecule like paraffin is called an alkane because only single bonds connect all of the carbon atoms. Cracking uses heat and sometimes a catalyst. To crack the paraffin, a small amount is dropped onto a piece of glass wool. A ceramic catalyst is heated. The heat causes air inside the apparatus to expand, and air bubbles out of the water. After a few minutes, the paraffin is heated, and it starts to break down. The product is a colorless gas collected in a water-filled test tube and since the gas is displacing water, it's uncontaminated by air. Each liquid paraffin molecule has now been cracked or broken down into two shorter gas molecules. The end of one of them has a carbon-to-carbon -carbon double bond. A carbon molecule which has one or more such double bonds is called an alkene. Once a full tube of gas has been collected, it'll be sealed with a cork and ready for testing. Bromine water will be added to the colorless gas in the tube to test for the presence of an alkene. Shake the tube to mix the bromine water and gas, and if the gas contains molecules with any double bonds, the bromine will react and become a colorless liquid. Because identical alkene molecules are the basic units which join together to form plastics, they're called monomers, meaning single units. Monomers like building blocks, can link together to form long chains called polymers, which means many units. One of the most common polymers in use today is polystyrene. Polystyrene is made from monomers of styrene. Styrene is a runny, clear liquid that looks and drips like water. The chemical structure of styrene looks like this. It forms a polymer by opening up its double bond. The end of one monomer bonds to the end of another, and so on. This chain bonding is called polymerization. Styrene will polymerize at room temperature, but slowly. To increase the reaction rate, a small amount of initiator is added. And then the styrene is immersed in a hot water bath and remains there for one hour. Now let's test a sample of the styrene to see if the consistency has changed. It's definitely getting thicker and dripping more slowly. Leave it for an additional hour, take another sample, and now let's see. The styrene is even thicker. It's forming polystyrene. 
and eventually it'll become a rigid plastic. In industry, making polystyrene begins with mixing and heating styrene monomers in these huge sealed tanks. Additives add rigidity and a whiteness, and the end product emerges as white pellets of polystyrene, ready to be melted and molded into all sorts of shapes. This is pure sulfur. It's been extracted from rocks in the Earth's crust. Starting with sulfur, how would you make sulfuric acid, by far the chemical most used in industry? Let's find out. When sulfur is heated over a gentle flame, it melts and forms a runny yellow liquid. Heated more strongly, the sulfur darkens and becomes much more viscous, something like molasses. But when sulfur is heated in the open air, it combines with oxygen and burns. When placed in a jar containing pure oxygen, the reaction is much stronger, producing a characteristic blue flame. The white fumes left behind are sulfur dioxide, and this reaction is the starting point for making sulfuric acid. This is a factory where sulfuric acid is made. Liquid sulfur arrives in a huge tanker. It's sprayed into a furnace and burned in a blast of dry air. Inside the furnace, sulfur is combined with oxygen in the air to form sulfur dioxide. As the sulfur dioxide leaves the furnace, it travels to the converter where it reacts with even more oxygen. A high temperature of 450 degrees Celsius and a catalyst of divanadium pentoxide speed up the reaction. Sulfur dioxide and oxygen are converted into the desired sulfur trioxide. Two sulfur dioxide molecules combine with one oxygen molecule to form two molecules of sulfur trioxide. But if the temperature rises too high, the sulfur trioxide tends to break back down into sulfur dioxide and oxygen, so unfortunately it's a reversible reaction, which can go forwards or backwards depending on the temperature. So, at the production plant, they make sure the reactor doesn't get too hot. In the final step, sulfur trioxide gas flows into the bottom of an absorbing tower. Here it meets a solution of previously made sulfuric acid. The sulfur trioxide reacts with the water in the sulfuric acid solution to produce even more sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is called the king of chemicals, so important are its many uses. One important property is as a strong dehydrating agent. Here, concentrated sulfuric acid has been added to ordinary sugar. The chemical reaction is vigorous, producing water molecules and considerable heat. The heat will convert the water to steam leaving behind only carbon. 